Thank you, Lord, Father Mitch Packer. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, where we take a look at the writings of the church. And we uh, want to begin by mentioning today is the Feast of St. Scholastica. She was born in the town of Nursia, today it's called Norcia, in Italy, and was the twin sister of Benedict. Ben St. Benedict later started the Order of Benedictines, and his sister began a convent of, of nuns. Uh, both of them came from a very, very wealthy family, but they also saw the corruption that had permeated Roman culture. And the, the Benedict had tried to study in Rome, and he went off to, to be a hermit. She later on joined with some other women to start a convent nearby. And they stayed close uh, in their life. And what's very important is that between the two of them, starting the Benedictine order for men and for women, they completely transformed the barbarians who were invading Europe. It took them time, it took their order many years after they had both died. They didn't live to see it at all. But what God had begun with them transformed the barbarians into Europeans by teaching them faith in Christ and teaching them to pray and eventually teaching them to read and write and learn. And this is one of the great gifts that we have from the Benedictines. All right, um, we are now going through uh, Pope St. John Paul's encyclical known as Veritatis Splendor, which means Splendor of Truth. You can get a paperback copy from EWTN's religious catalog by either going to the website EWTNRC. Dot com, or you can call 1-800-854-6316. Or if you prefer, you can download a free electronic copy of Veritatis Splendor by going to our website, ewtn.com. Go to the top, you see Document Library, and type that in, uh, Veritatis Splendor. You can download it into your computer for free. Print it out at your own expense. Now, we'd love to have you involved in the show. You can do like these nice folks have done by coming here to beautiful Irondale, Alabama, right next door to Birmingham. Or you can send us a question by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. Or you can call during our live broadcast on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. You can adjust it to your own time zone. Uh, the phone number in North America is 1-800-221-9460. Or if you're outside North America or inside Birmingham area, call 205-271-2980. All right, we finished paragraph 8 last week. And now we are about to begin paragraph 9, which, is, which takes its title from Matthew 19, uh, verse uh, 17, which is, there is only one who is good. Now, he quotes uh, from our Lord's question, Lord questioning rich, rich young man. Remember last week we started with the rich young man. And the rich young man had said, what must I do to gain eternal life? And he calls Jesus a good teacher. Jesus' first question is, why do you ask me about what is good? One there is who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Now, this is very, very rich. And the Pope reflects on that very deeply in the section. Jesus wants the young man to have a clear idea of why he asked his question, where we see that the good teacher points out to him and to all of us who read the gospel the uh, 
answer to the question, uh, what good must I do to have eternal life? That was the question the rich young man asked. What good must I do to gain eternal life? This is a question about the meaning of life. My purpose is to go to heaven and avoid hell. And to do that, I must do good. But um, what our Lord's answer to him, which is yet another question, our Lord answers the young man by posing a very important question, saying, no one is good but God alone. And he wants people to turn their heart and their mind to that issue. No one is good but God alone. And therefore, the conclusion we should draw from that is, only God can answer the question about what is good, because God is the good itself. This is a very important question because in contrast to many people in our society, where people ask, what are other people saying? What is accepted by a large number of people? There are many folks in our culture who say, look, society is changing. We must adapt and you must adapt to it as well. Very common, isn't it? Well, if that were the case, then society has for a long time been telling lots of lies from top to bottom. From your two-year-old, I didn't do it, <laughs> there's stuff all over his face, to people in high places in politics, so around the world. So, I mean, it, it doesn't matter. So does that mean that therefore we're going to accept lying? Well, we'll accept it when we're doing it. We just don't like to be lied to. That's usually the way it goes. No, no, no. The, the world's way of saying that, you know, what are people doing and saying is not the way of Jesus Christ. And simply accepting what is presently acceptable to many people, what is popular to many people, is not the issue Jesus claims is true. Rather, goodness comes from God. And, therefore, and if we want to be good, we have to seek the one who is good. So to ask this question about the good is ultimately uh, requires us to turn to God, to the source of goodness and the fullness of goodness. Jesus shows that the young man's question is really a religious question. And this is something that is a, a crisis in our own society because we typically are taking questions of morality away from religious questions because we are not permitted to teach right and wrong, good and evil, from a religious basis in our schools. You can't use the Bible. You can't bring that in since 1962. You can't say thou shalt not kill. Why not? Because who told you thou shalt not? Well, it was God. So you can't do that. So this is part of the crisis in Western society where God and religion are not allowed to be part of the discussion of what is good and evil. But Christ, Christ does see it as a religious issue by saying God is the one who is good. That's the Pope's point. And also that goodness, the goodness that attracts and at the same time that obliges us to act correctly is from God. God is the source of that goodness. 
you know, uh, you know we, we like good. I, which one of us would not like to live in a society where nobody steals from you, nobody hacks your computer, nobody tries to kill you or rob you? I would like that. I would love to be in a place where crime is at a minimum. In many ways, we can look, some of us who are old enough can look back to the 50s when there was very little murder and really not that much stealing. It wasn't very common. Um, so we'd like, we're attracted to what's good. We're attracted to a good society based on good morality. We'd like to be able to walk the streets of our cities without fear. That would be wonderful. We have so many beautiful cities. But, so that, that attracts us. But at the same time, what is good is an obligation. If it's attractive, then you're obligated to be good yourself and not wish that everybody else was good. And, that, and, and that ultimately, the good is God himself. God alone is worthy of being loved with all one's heart, mind, and soul. Remember what, when a Pharisee asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus, our Lord, quotes from Leviticus 19, uh, as well as Deuteronomy, uh, me, De Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Everything. Notice Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 does not say you shall love the Lord your God with about 90% of your heart. All right, uh, we'll make it easy for you. 50-50. No. All your heart, all your soul, and no human being deserves everything from you. Why not? Because no human being gave you everything that you are. Your existence and the world in which you exist, the existence of your soul, all depends on God. So only God deserves your whole heart, mind, and soul. Now, that's where the Leviticus 19 comes in. Jesus says the second command is love your neighbor as yourself. You don't ignore or discard your neighbor. But you don't love your neighbor, not your wife, not your husband, not your children, not your parents, as much as you love God. He's, he's going to be number one. And ironically, you know, I see say, well, that, you know, wait a minute, that doesn't sound fair. Well, let's take a look at the Pope's next point. God is the source of man's happiness. And one of the, I, I tell this to couples when I'm getting them ready for marriage. If you love your spouse more than you love God, you're making a terrible mistake because you will expect your spouse to be as good as God. And you will quickly find out well before the end of the honeymoon, they are not. They are not as good as God. But if you love God first, then you will be able to accept your spouse as a fellow sinner. And I can deal with them in, from a perspective. And I don't expect them to be more than they are or more than they ever can be. I'll let God be God, and my spouse and I are sinners trying to get to God together. That's perspective, and that's why God is the source of happiness. He puts us all in perspective. It's also, to me, why atheists are never very funny. You know what? They no, don't have any perspective on themselves or anybody else. They make themselves the center of everything, and the, 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 they're, they can use cynicism, but they, who does a belly laugh with an atheist? They're not that funny. They're usually pretty mad, too, <laughs> and resentful. Jesus brings the question about morally good action 
right back to its source, which is the religious foundations of morality. And also to acknowledging God, who alone is goodness. God alone is the fullness of life. God is the final end of human activity. By the end, he means the goal, the purpose. You know, you have to ask, why are you doing this? Why are you trying to become a multi-billionaire? If it's just to beat everybody else out, that I have more money than they do, what good will it do you when you die? Nothing. You can't, you know, there's a great story. This one guy said, oh, I know, I'll do something, I'll be really rich, and I'll get a whole, you know, one of those things of gold that they have over at Fort Knox. It's one of these bricks, just a solid gold. I'll bring that, and, I'll, and then God will let me into heaven. And St. Peter meets him when he dies, says, what are you doing with paving stones? <laughs> That's what they use just to pave the street. This is nothing, nothing. At Fort Knox, it means a lot. In heaven, it's pavement. <laughs> we walk on it. So that, that, that helps to get perspective. The goal is to give glory to God. That's the uh, end of human activity and the perfect happiness God can offer and gold cannot. Just add, by the way, if you don't believe me, ask the people who bought gold when it was $2,000 an ounce. <laughs> It's down a little bit. Paragraph 10 continues. The church believes that man, man who is made in the image of the Creator, which is today's reading from Genesis chapter 1. When God said in Genesis chapter 1, let us make man in our own image and likeness, in the image and likeness of God, let us make them male and female. So, so we're made in the image of, light, uh, of the God, the Creator. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Infinite God died on the cross so we can have redemption. And we are made holy, we are sanctified by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the church believes that man who has all this going from, from, from God, it was God's initiative to create Christ came to redeem us. We didn't say do it this way. It's His initiative. Holy Spirit sanctifies us at His initiative. So we believe, the church believes that man has as the ultimate purpose of life to live, quote, for the praise of God's glory. This is something in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, that in Christ, according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will, we who have first hoped in Christ have been destined and appointed to live for the praise of his glory. Now, none of the folks here in the audience are kids my age roughly or a little bit less, a little bit more. And they all know, why did God make you? To know, love, and serve Him in this life and to be happy with Him forever in heaven. You know, the, uh, the second question in the catechism. First question was, who made me? God made me. Why did God make me? That's the purpose, to praise God. And we got that right from the Bible. And that uh, all of us strive to make all of our actions reflect the splendor of God's glory. Everything we do, the way you live your marriage, the way you raise your children, the way you grow up and honor your parents, all, everything in life, your work, your career, every aspect of life, all of that is meant for the splendor of God's glory. And that's why the Pope quotes from uh, St. Ambrose, the, his book, uh, Hexameron uh, Diaz 6, Sermo 9, uh, paragraph, uh, uh, chapter 8, verse 50, um, where St. Ambrose wrote, Know then, O beautiful soul, that you 
are the image of God. Know that you are the glory of God. Hear who, how you are his glory. The prophet says in Psalm 139 verse 6, Your knowledge has become too wonderful for me. That is to say, in my work, your majesty has become more wonderful. In the counsels of men, your wisdom is exalted. When I consider myself such as I am known to you in my secret thoughts and deepest emotions, the mysteries of your knowledge are disclosed to me. Know then, O oh man, your greatness and be vigilant. This is a very important second basis in for morality. To know that God is the source of all goodness, but that human beings who are created in His image and likeness also are created you know, with glory and honor. And that is going to be one of the key issues of dealing with morality because a, a lot of times you'll hear modern people say, well, what does it matter if I do this or that little thing? Because nobody else is affected by what I do. Doesn't hurt anybody else. So, um, you, know, uh, let, you know, it's okay if I do it, isn't it? No, it's not. Because there are many sins that one can do all alone which are an attack on one's own dignity. That's the issue. For instance, pornography is a great example. This, and you know, take a look at how the world is getting all excited to celebrate St. Valentine's Day. First of all, they're kicking out the part saint. They're not talking about St. Valentine, it's just Valentine's Day. Even when Al Capone had a bunch of people killed, allegedly. The, uh, it was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Today they don't even do that. And so instead, the big celebration in the world is going to be Fifty Shades of Grey. And it's interesting, just pay attention to that. Um, the character is Christian Grey. He's not black and white, he's just grey. And his, the woman that he, he physically abuses in this pornographic novel, people say, oh, well, she agreed to it. See, this is, the, this is what we're saying here. The fact that he abused her, because he's a rich man picking a girl who's not very attractive, and then does it even though she agrees. And even though you are reading it all by yourself, this is still all an attack on the dignity of the human personality and soul. So it doesn't matter that you're not going off to do this with somebody else. And again, I, I said this last week, I found it so amazing and inconsistent that the NFL fires a broadcaster, former football player, for allegedly being with prostitutes and physically roughing them up. Meanwhile, at the Super Bowl, they advertise Fifty Shades of Grey, which is about a really, another really rich guy, you know, roughing up a woman. Now, this is not right. This is not right. And it's all an attack on human dignity. That's why. Know then, O oh man, your greatness, and be vigilant. That's what St. Ambrose says to us. So what man is and what he must do becomes clear as soon as God reveals himself. You know, one of the things we see, God is light and the source of light. So he can reveal to us, this is what I want you to be. You're in my image and likeness. And therefore, you know, I want you to live in this particular way. He's the one who's able to do that. That's why we see at the beginning of the Ten Commandments, 
What's the basis? The, the, the basis for all the commandments begins in Exodus 20, verses 2 and 3, where he says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. That's the basis of all the other commandments, who God is and what he did. And then from that, he said, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not take my name in vain. Honor the Sabbath. Keep holy the Sabbath. Honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not kill, commit adultery, steal, bear false witness, covet, and so on. So we see that the ten words, as they're called in Hebrew, you know, the Asherah um, Devarim, the ten words of the covenant with Israel, and throughout the whole law of the Old Testament, God makes himself known. That's why they, they, that's why they stood out. God revealed himself, unlike to any other people. And uh, he also is acknowledged as the one who alone is good. Only God is good in, in the, the Old Testament. That the one who, despite the fact that man sins, and this is one of the problems. When you get in the Old Testament, you know, one of the last things you, I would ever want is to be one of the people in the Old or New Testament. Why? Because they're going to write about your sins and read it in church every week and then call it Scripture. I don't want my sins uh, tough enough to tell my confessor, yet alone the whole world to know. Everybody knows about David's adultery and murder. Would you want that? I don't think so. God in his mercy doesn't have me part of that. Um, but despite the fact that of human sin, God is the model for moral action. That's why he said to Moses, to in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2, say to all the congregation of the people of Israel, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Notice, the Bible doesn't say, you shall be okay, because I'm okay. That's, that's psychology. I'm okay, you're okay. That's nice. Um, but God doesn't say that. You be holy, for I am holy. By the way, uh, St. Peter repeated that in his epistle. And God is the one who is faithful to his love and gives his law. As you see in Exodus 19, he reminds Moses that, you know, I promised your fathers, and now I'm fulfilling it. And this is uh, uh, the reason that God and his fidelity to his love gives the law to Israel. And the goal of giving them the law is in order to restore man's original and peaceful harmony with God the Creator and with all creation itself. You know, that's why it is good you know, to be very careful about how we treat the environment. Global warming and all that, well, Ask him up in Massachusetts about that. But, you know, whether you believe in global warming or not, the issue is that you do take care of the environment because harmony with all of creation is part of what we do. And that, that's one of the goals of the moral life. And we, we see that uh, this harmony is also with God so that God can draw us to his divine love. As we read in Leviticus 26, verse 12, the Lord God says, I will walk among you, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people. That's the definition of the relationship. So the moral life presents itself as a response to God's initiatives taken out of love for man. And it's a response of love. As we see, already mentioned in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. 
And these words which I command you shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. Not waiting till they're 18 before they decide if they want to do right and wrong. Teach them diligently to your children. You know, your whole life long. Thus, the moral life, which is caught up in the giftedness of God's love, the gratuitous, his love to us is freely given, not earned by us. That, uh, this moral life is called to reflect God's glory. As Pope St. Leo wrote, for the one who loves God, it is enough to be pleasing to the one whom he loves. For no greater reward should be sought than that love itself. Charity, in fact, is of God in such a way that God himself is charity. In fact, in this picture that we have on the set of St. Ignatius Loyola, you see him with a book. At the top of the book is the same theme that is the key of St. Ignatius' spirituality, where he, sa- he writes in that book and throughout it, it made the motto of the Society of Jesus, Ad Maiorum Dei Gloriam. A lot of times people abbreviate as AMDG, Ad Maiorum Dei Gloriam, which means to the greater glory of God. That is the purpose of our life. We're going to take a little break, come back and get some questions from you, our audience, and some emails. So please stay with us. First of all, I want to invite you to come on down here on pilgrimage. Uh, we have one couple from up in Delaware, uh, some from New York. Uh, it's nice to be a little away from the snow, isn't it? You know, it's, it's, it's pretty pleasant down here. Uh, still a little cool in the mornings, pleasant in the afternoons. And we'd love to have you come. If you're on your way down to Florida fleeing the snowstorms and such, do stop by. We'd love to have you. Just contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966 or go to EWTN.com and they will give you information about scheduling of masses, programs, um, places to stay and eat and all that. So we'll have to have it. And also while you're thinking of all those poor folks up in Massachusetts, um, keep them in prayer. They've had six feet of snow and that is just overwhelming overwhelming and getting food and milk and all that plus roofs caving in and all do keep them in your prayers and we have ways to help folks let's do it all right let's now go to a caller hello james james you there hello hi where are you from, James? Uh, Pennsylvania. Good. And your question? Uh, if, if a couple gets married in the church and one of the parties has the intention or the openness to use artificial contraception or get sterilized at some point, is, that, is the marriage valid or not? This, uh, it's not quite so simple. depends on what they're up to. If they are using contraception or sterilization and as a way to say I don't ever want to have children and that they are precluding the possibility of having children ever then the marriage is invalid okay it's not invalid if somewhere you know along the way they are using contraception 
that, but they intend eventually to have kids, it doesn't make the marriage invalid, but it would still be a mortal sin to be using the contraception, but it wouldn't make the marriage invalid. It would only be invalid if the per, one uh, person or both in the marriage has no intention of ever having children and takes action to preclude having children. That would make for invalidity of the marriage and is, a, is grounds for annulment. Um, you know, and and I, I've certainly dealt with cases where a, uh, you know, one partner revealed later that they had lied. You know, we ask at the marriage ceremony, are you willing to receive children from God and raise them in the law of Christ in His church? We ask that. And if they say yes, but are lying later on, they have broken their word. And, you know, A, it's not a very trustworthy person to begin with. If you break your word before God uh, and, and everybody else, uh, that's not very trustworthy. So that would be a problem. Um, but if they're, you know, they might be just doing it for a part, they intend to have children, but say, well, I'm going to use birth control now. That would be sinful, but it doesn't mean invalidity of the marriage because they eventually intend to have children, but on their time, not God's. That would be where the problem is. Sir, where are you from? Uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Great town. I love Cincinnati. And taught there for a couple of years and I still miss Grader's ice cream. Right. <laughs> Okay. And your question. Well, I, I was uh, uh, I, I was wondering about the uh, there seemed to be some some conflict with people I talked to uh, about the the Old Testament, particularly yeah. being literal in some senses. Mm -hmm. And some think it's not in other senses, like the six day creation, mm -hmm. maybe Jonah in the well. Mm -hmm. I, I seem to seem like there's a uh, problem if you take some of that not to be literal. Then when you go to the New Testament, you, you could argue, sure. well, the the contra uh, the uh, the virgin birth would be not be literal, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the when the priest consecrates the host and so on. Sure. And I just wondered. So if how do we deal with some? Yeah, of how do you deal with that? You know, uh, there are a couple of things. Pope Leo the Thirteenth, you know, wrote a wonderful uh, encyclical on the Holy Spirit and, and Scripture, and made it clear that hey, we must study Scripture, make it available. As a matter of fact, he was the one who ordered it printed in all Catholic Bibles that there is an indulgence for um, uh, reading Scripture. See, a lot of times you hear people say, I, I don't know where this comes from, um, that, oh, so the, the nuns told us we were not allowed to read Scripture. The Pope said, I'll give you indulgence. I said, I got Catholics to do stuff, give them an indulgence. Um, and, but he also said that we take the Scripture literally. However, both he and Pope Pius XII in Divino Aflante Spiritu talks about how we must understand it by the idioms of its day. So for instance, the six days of creation. This is, uh, what is a day? How do, you, how do you define what a day is? What makes it something a day? 24 hours, which is based on, why do we have 24 hours? They just say, oh, I feel like. No, not the sun, of the earth. The, the earth spinning on its axis, all right? A year is our uh, orbit around the sun, but the day is the spinning of the earth on its axis, right? Now, if you notice at the beginning of creation, the earth wasn't made yet, nor was the sun or the moon. So that a day could not yet be 24 hours. It would be a day by some other measurement. See, that the term day is relative. So you, you say, well, what would that day be? How long did it take for galaxies to spin around? You know, that's why the, you know, the 14 billion years that we have, you know, it would be a sidereal day. <laughs> You know, or a galactic day or something like that. Um, and then leave that up to the physicists to tell us all about that. But 
you know, the um, amount of time that various planets spin is different than, uh, on their axis, different than the Earth and so on. So uh, day is a, a, a truly relative term. And if there's no sun, moon, stars on Earth, then day is going to be defined differently. And I'm much more impressed by, say, the six days of creation that, um, you know, you, you st have it beginning with light. That wasn't known to physicists until the 20th century with the Big Bang Theory by a Jesuit priest, in fact, Father Lemaitre. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, we can take it on its terms so long as we understand they're dealing with their idioms. Our science is going to give us new information about such idioms. They just talk in general about the sea monsters. Or they don't even say the sea monsters, just the monsters. That's the people ask, well, where are the dinosaurs in the creation? It's there in Genesis 1 with the word for monsters, the tananim. But they don't define them much because they don't know much about it. It's stuff that we learn. We have another caller. Hello, Vanessa? Yes, Father Mitch. Hi, what can we do for you today? Okay, I have a question that I've been wondering about for so long. Well, tell for, me what it is. Okay, for instance, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4. Yes, All right, let me okay, get there. Okay, I'll wait till you get to it. All right, I'm right there. Go, giddy up. What you got? Okay, do you see how it goes on? And then it says, um, heir of all things through whom also he made the world, and world is plural. And I found three other times in the Bible that world is plural. All I want to know, did God create two worlds? Maybe more than one world? And what, what does your translation say again for Hebrews 1 verse 4? It says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers of the, by the oh, prophets. Oh, that's, no, that's why I'm confused because you're, uh, that's chapter 1 verse 1. Uh, 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 oh, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 4. He made the world, and world is plural. Okay, there it is. Yes, yes. Dihu kai apoye sentusayonas. Yeah, it's, now, the word that he uses is ayon, ayon. And this means the age, but it also, see, this is one of the things, too. The English word wo uh, world comes from an old English world word that was war ruled w-o-r-u-l-d war ruled and then we read it to world and it meant a period of time or a place so notice how we say in um, the Gloria the, the, the glory be to the father world without end. And now, it doesn't, in that place, it, uh, again, you can uh, see in, in the Latin of it too, that it doesn't refer to physical worlds, but it refers to times. And the, the normal word for world as a place in Greek would be cosmos. And we, we use that word, the cosmos. But they don't use the word cosmos, so they use the word ion, meaning uh, the, the periods of time. So this would be, um, you know, uh, especially in this context, because from the beginning of these days, he's spoken in his son, uh, who he made the, the, the one who inherits the, the, the heir of all things, uh, and through which he made Tus Ionas, the ages. So that would be probably, uh, they use world as a correct use of the word world, but in modern English we've limited it to the physical place, whereas the older use of it meaning times or periods of time or aeons, that would be, and we, we use that word in, in English, aeons. Uh, that's a Greek word, that's the, and that's the exact word that's used there, aeons. So, I think in this context, when he's talking about the, from the end of the days, or the last of the days, he's also talking about the, the t uh, periods of time and not uh, other worlds as 
places, though maybe there are other worlds, I don't know. Uh, I've only been to this one, and I haven't been everywhere here. But uh, it's most likely a time uh, terminology being used there. Also, let's take an email. It's kind of related to some of this. Dear Father Paco, with all the controversy about the theory of evolution, why were we not given more information on the miracle of creation? Things such as the Big Bang. How did he create all the matter in the universe? Why in the world did he create dinosaurs to rule the earth for millions of years? Why didn't Jesus say something about the design of the human species? Even if it was just to say that we would understand this when we die and enter the kingdom of God. I know that God is love, but to me, he also is an amazing architect. I would just like to know more about this part of him. Maybe there's no concrete answer, but I'd be very much interested in your opinion. And there was a, there was a little part of this. He said, God talked to about uh, what's right and wrong. Why didn't he explain the Big Bang Theory? Okay, things like that. Here's one of the, I, I, this is an analogy I use from my own growing up and the growing up of a lot of other people. When you have small children, you have to tell them to behave. Correct? They don't spontaneously behave <laughs> very well, unless they want something. And even then, they don't always. Uh, <laughs> at least I didn't. Uh, but so parents tell the kids to behave, tell them right and wrong from the time they're very small. Share with your brother. Don't hit anybody, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Sort of like a confessional here. <laughs> but on the other hand, the same parents will not show their kid how to do everything, but will help them learn how to do it on their own. For instance, my parents gave me coloring books. All right? They were much better at coloring than I was. They could stay inside the lines, but they didn't stop me from coloring outside the lines. By coloring, I learned how to color inside the lines. Or my favorite puzzle was connect the dots. I used to love connect the dot puzzles. They didn't do it for me. They let me learn how to do it. And this is the, a good parallel to God tells us what's right and wrong. But he also trusts us to be, it gave a curiosity to human beings and an intellect so that we do learn how to think through these things. We make mistakes and we learn more about science. Science is always learning more. And he likes us to learn about these things. Just think of how amazing it is. If we were at the center of the Milky Way, there would be too much light from the other stars to see the rest of outer space. We think it's just all kind of bright out there. But we are two-thirds of the way outside the Milky Way, and we can see the center as well as the other galaxies. And God likes us learning how to do that stuff. This is something that is very useful, I think. And, you know, he, he likes us getting smart. Just like mom and dad like me to learn how to color inside the lines. All right, we have another caller. Hello, Donna. Yes, hello, Father. Thank you for taking my call. Fine. Where are you from? I'm from Connecticut. Ooh, how's the snow up by you? <laughs> oh, it's okay. We've got oh, a little bit of a breather right now. Oh, good, good, good. I know Massachusetts has hit hard. I didn't know if you were, too. So what's your question? Uh, yes. Um, when teaching scripture via the historical critical method, mm -hmm. what things should be affirmed to students so as to avoid the potential dangers of this method? And I'm thinking in particular of our understanding of the physical aspects of Jesus' miracles. Okay, let me ask you this, first of all. Uh, are you married? Yes, sir. Uh, does your, uh, is your husband a handyman kind of guy? Oh, absolutely. Okay, this be, then this will be maybe a good way to explain it. The critical historical methods are tools. I, you know, that's why I went to graduate school, to learn those tools. And I got my PhD in Old Testament to learn the languages, the grammar, about the texts, which manuscripts are the best, and so on. 
how to deal with the form, you know, understand the forms of speech, the ancient history, the, uh, uh, the editing process, and the history of the tradition, and so on. We study all those things, but they're tools. Now, the danger for handy men is that if they just sort of go crazy buying more and more tools, because for us guys, going to the outdoors store or going to the hardware store is our toy store. Oh, honey, I could really use this one. I don't have one of these yet. And we'll just buy more tools, even though we're not working on the project. We just want, oh, that's, a good, that's a, such a cool tool. I never saw it. And you get carried away with the tools, and you don't bother to learn how to use them to apply them to actually fixing the faucet. And this is mm -hmm. the same with the, the methods. The methods are great tools, but we use them in the, you know, at the service, not of the tools, but at the service of the text. And for Christians, it's not the text simply as, you know, as if I were uh, studying Shakespeare. Matter of fact, sometimes people studying Shakespeare have more respect for the text. It's mm -hmm. rather that I do this in service of the faith. Now, one of the other things, the tools can only do so much. If you don't have a house, your tools are useless to fix it up. <laughs> Maybe you need other tools to build one. Now, by analogy, when you deal with the miracles of Jesus, you have to ask, what claim can any of the scholars have to prove by the historical critical method that the miracles did not happen? They can't. It's impossible to prove by those tools the miracles did not happen. They substitute their own act of denying faith in miracles as a basis for saying that miracles don't happen. They say it's the critical tools. It's not. They have chosen to work on some shack instead of the mansion of Scripture. And they're trying to deal it with another way. That would be a, 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 an incorrect approach towards it. Okay? So that would be how I used to teach the methods. I, I, I love the historical critical methods, but I know that I approach it with an act of faith. I'm very upfront about that. And I, and I find that it unpacks things. You might want to take a look at the Vatican II document on Revelation and see what they have to say there, okay? Another question from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? New York. Good to have you here. Thank and you. your question? It's about St. Ignatius, Father. Yes. I was wondering if the year of his birth, his okay. ordination, and about his ministry and where his ministry took him. Sure. Uh, St. Ignatius was born in 1493, a year after Columbus left Spain. Um, he became a soldier. He was the youngest of a uh, uh, family about 10, 11, uh, that, and so he just, he couldn't inherit, his brother inherited the castle, but he went off to serve the emperor and was a soldier and such, and was wounded at a battle at Pamplona. And he had a conversion while he was recuperating from the wounds. And in the 1520s, he began going back to school. Um, he got in trouble in Spain, so he went to Paris and there he met the first members of what became the Society of Jesus. And uh, only one of them was ordained at the time, Peter, uh, now St. Peter Fa uh, Faber. Uh, Ignatius and the others went to Italy. Uh, they were trying to get to the Holy Land, couldn't get there. But they went to Rome, put themselves at the service of the Pope. St. Ignatius was ordained, I believe, in 1541 or so, 1540, 41 and uh, founded the society and then died in 1546. Oh, 1556, sorry, 1556. All right, all those dates, we have run out of time. The Lord bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. And remember, uh, this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible. And so we ask that you please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill.
and we will be able to pay all of our bills. As you know, we're going through a big lawsuit, and we need your help for that, as well as keeping the network going. Thank you, and God bless.